The year was 1853. Louisa Dalton Bird Cunningham, get that name down, that's a nice long name for you, was taking a cruise down the Potomac River in 1853, and, and she noticed an old mansion on the riverbanks. It once had been a beautiful home, but it was literally falling apart due to weather and age and no one taking care of it. And Cunningham, she could not believe her ears when she heard the person, the guide on the trip, telling the people going down that river that day that that was Mount Vernon, the home of the first president of the United States, George Washington. Ms. Cunningham was, was very saddened about this downtrodden house of the former president, and so she wrote a letter to her invalid daughter, her daughter Anne Pamela Cunningham, complaining about the sorry state of the former president's home and, and that it should be a place of, to be preserved for posterity. And no one knows if it was her mother's eloquence and her letter to Anne. But what, do we, what we do know is that Anne, Anne had spent 21 years bedridden because of an accident she'd had while riding a horse. But when Anne somehow... In her mother's letter, something stirred Anne up, and she forgot about her energies, and she focused on a new vision to restore Mount Vernon to its former glory. And thus, Anne founded the Mount Vernon Ladies' Association. She began to write letters to all the local newspapers, soliciting funds and support for her work, and she talked to citizens about all this. She, she wanted to preserve President Washington's home. And so she also persuaded some famous people and some very influential people and very wealthy people to, to help with the effort. And she began a, a massive fundraising campaign. And in just a few short years, the Mount Vernon's Lady, Ladies Association had bought, had bought the house, had refurbished it, the president's former home, and turn it into a national monument. The association, the Mount Vernon Women's Association, Ladies Association, still exists today, and it still holds the keys to Mount Vernon. Now, I was going to ask you, have any of you ever restored anything in your life? Any of you ever restored a mansion as large as Mount Vernon? Okay, probably not, okay. But we all restored things, or we've tried to restore things. I don't know how your restoration works, but sometimes my restoration work doesn't turn out quite as restored as I thought it should, and sometimes I have to hire someone to actually restore my restored effort. But anyway, we've all tried to restore things. And sometimes, even in our own lives, we feel like we need to be restored and renewed. Ever felt that way? Okay. Well, we live in a society, a culture, if you will, that has a high desire for restoration. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever walked down one of these aisles, but uh, you may have. Uh, I think most of you probably have. Anyone ever walked down the aisles of Lowe's or Home Depot by chance? Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, that is a symbol of our desire for restoration and repair, okay? We have all these television shows. You know, one of my favorites, which has been around since I think I was about this tall, is this old house, and the house just keeps getting older and older, and I keep redoing it, you know? Or the Home and Garden Channel. We have this ongoing desire to restore, but it's an assertion of our American optimism. We want to believe that what is done is not always done. We want to believe that what's broken can be fixed, what's ravaged can be restored, that we can have one more swing at it, if you will, that we can wipe the slate clean one more time, that we can somehow go back to square one and start over again. We ache to make things like new again. This plays out in our culture in many ways. There are many ways we try to restore and make things new again. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the ACT or the SAT. Ever heard of those tests? Yeah. 
My kids have taken them uh, multiple times, and I got one still to take it multiple times. But anyway, you don't just take the test once, by the way. Back in my day, in the dark ages, when we had stone and chisel, I took it one time. But, uh, but now you take the test over and over and over again, okay, hoping to get better and better and better scores. And the good news is on the ACT and the SAT is that the universities you apply to only see your best score. But we want to do better and better. And then there's that email spam thing or radio advertisement that I'm hearing now. It says, he says, if you're a male over 50, turn back the clock. You ever heard that one? Yeah, it's out there. And I'm a male over 50. And let me tell you, I'd like to turn back the clock a few times. But they say that, you know, they can give you this growth hormone, they can sell you a growth hormone of some sort that, that will increase your memory, that will increase your muscular strength, that will reduce your wrinkles, and also increase your, decrease your body fat. It's a miracle drug, and it will restore you and renew you. And then there's the environmental, meth, the environmental movement. They're dedicated to preserving the virgin forests of the world and, and the undefiled natural areas of the world. And whenever they find an area that has already been polluted, these groups fight hard to re-virginize, if you will, those areas back to their natural, natural state. Restoration. Restoration is deeply rooted in the American ethos, the American culture, the American desire but it's also deeply rooted in the Christian desire. How many times have we messed up in life? Now, you don't have to give me a number on this, okay? How many times have we messed up in life and wanted to restore a relationship we messed up? Or even to restore our souls? How many times have we done that? How many times? And the first step to doing that is what? The first step to restoring our souls and restoring ourselves is to admit we are all sinners. We have to start there. We have to first admit we are all sinners. Now, is there anyone here that's not a sinner? Raise your hand. Okay, I just want to make sure I was in a, in a friendly crowd, okay? We're all sinners. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We, we all want something called do-overs, don't we? We like a few do-overs. We want to become an unsinner. We want to live as though we have never sinned. We know our sin has left us broken. It's left us ravaged. It's left us unclean. It's left us impure. And we desperately desire someone or something that will restore us to wholeness. We're anxious to find a way to turn back the clock on time, if you will, to, to take the test again, to clean up the mess we've made. So how can that level of restoration happen in our lives? Well, this week, we're in the second week of our sermon series on who's on first. And in the second week, we are uh, continuing to discuss the confusion that we often have over the position that we play in the disciple-making game. For last week, I showed you a clip from the movie Abbott and Costello, who's on first, a little skit. But the skit was to remind us just how confused we get about what our role is and what position we play. This week, we will focus primarily on Jesus and Jesus' position. It's a position that none of us can play in this room. None of us can be Jesus, okay? I want to make that clear. Doesn't matter if you're clergy or laity or who you are, only one person, one person can play that role. Jesus takes and plays the position of the one above us all, the one above us all. You know, years before Jesus walked this earth and was resurrected, the people of God turned to the temple in Jerusalem, asking the priests to help them regain and purify themselves. Here in the letter of Hebrews that Zach read a few moments ago, it reminds us that the high priests of that day were put in charge of things pertaining to God. 
They were given responsibility to, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. That was their main function. They were to offer the gifts and the sacrifices for sin there at the temple. And one day in particular, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies. That Holy of Holies was there in the heart of the temple. It was a place that only the high priest could go into. He would enter the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle on the mercy seat there in the Holy of Holies the blood of the sin offerings. The offering would lead to the reconciliation between God and the people and would restore their broken relationship. It was the grand do-over, if you will, the big do-over. God would purify people from their sins. They would receive, in a sense, their secondary purity through that act. That was then, and this now is now. Hebrews tells us the priests, the high priests of the temple, the priests were, were many in number. There were many priests for Israel because they were prevented from, by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds the priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Say that with me. Jesus holds the priesthood permanently because he continues forever. That's good news, isn't it? Amen? Since we do not rely on a particular set of weak, vulnerable, mortal human beings called clergy, that's good news. We don't rely on them to do some mumbo-jumbo involving animals and blood and mysterious rituals. It means that Jesus Jesus is able for all time, that's right, Jesus is able for all time to save those who approach God through him. And since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's right. Jesus is able for all time to do that because he is able always to make intercession for us. Given the messes we make of our lives, you and I do need someone who's always working, always working to make intercession for us. Someone always putting passion into intervening with God on our behalf. The fact is, we are all sinners. But Jesus Christ offers an opportunity to be unsinned and unpolluted and restored to perfect Purity. Hear that again. In Jesus Christ, we are offered an opportunity to be unsinned, unpolluted, and restored to perfect purity. And that is amazing grace. It's incredibly attractive to messed up mortals like you and me. It's altogether more remarkable than, than any environmental effort to clean polluted water. Restoring the focus of our hearts. That's what happens in Jesus Christ. We're able to restore the focus of our hearts back into discipleship, back into disciple making, what we were called to be a part of from the very beginning. You know, you might call this the Christian cleanup campaign, if you will, okay? You know, spiritual renewal, spiritual recycling, spiritual revitalization, spiritual recovery. Spiritual restoration, spiritual revival. It is available to all. It is available to absolutely everyone who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. Let me introduce you to a fellow named Lonnie Davis. Lonnie Davis was born in East Baltimore in the 1950s. He graduated from high school. He joined the Army Reserve, the Navy Reserve, actually. And he tried, he tried to serve, he served in the Army Reserve, he, the Navy Reserve. He actually got sent to Thailand to serve over there. And, and there he was exposed for the first time to heroin. He tried it. And by the time he got home, he was hooked. He was hooked. He soon was hooked so much on heroin that he was spending $600 a day 
on that addiction. That's a lot. $600 a day to feed his heroin addiction. He turned to dealing drugs. And he says this, For 13 years, I was a zombie. Only after overdosing in 1993 did he actually kick the habit. He kicked the habit there in the Veterans Hospital in Baltimore. But when he kicked the habit, he got put right back out on the street. And for three years, he lived in a shelter. He began to manage a shelter's thrift shop. In 1995, Lonnie became a non-denominational minister. That's pretty good, isn't it? But you know, Jesus was not finished with this restoration project yet. Just like Jesus is not finished with our restoration project yet. Lonnie took a job. He took a job managing the shelter that he was now managing the thrift shop in, and he quickly proved that he had an eye for detail and efficiency. And the Baltimore officials were so impressed with his work with that one shelter that they did what? They gave him four more shelters to improve. He transformed all those mismanaged, deteriorating shelters into cleanliness and organization, and he received the nickname Reverend Fixer Up, or Street Savior was his other nickname. Lonnie has needle marks to this day still up and down his arms from drug use. But aside from that, he now enjoys a total restoration. And he's not alone. There was a former crack addict that spoke about him this way. He said, Lonnie gave me a positive attitude because he came clean, and that inspires me to come clean. There is no one beyond the restoring work of Jesus Christ. Amen? No one. No one beyond the restoring work of Jesus Christ. Not even a recovering addict who admits that he once was a lying, deceiving jerk. That's what he says about himself. No one is too sinful. No one is too dirty. No one is too damaged. Everyone is able to benefit from the forgiving grace and work of Jesus Christ. Even you and even me. That's right. All of us. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our high priest. He is holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Listen to that again. He is holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the, above the heavens. Now that is an impressive resume, okay? That is an impressive resume. And none of us None of us will ever have the qualifications to fill that position. I want to make that perfectly clear. None of us will ever be able to fill that position. Do, do all the exalted qualities, though, mean that he's out of touch with us? That, he, that he's unable to help us? No, not at all. He came to earth. He came to earth. He walked this earth in the flesh and the blood precisely so he would be able to help us, be in a position to help us become recovering sinners ourselves. That's why he did that. He came to this earth, he walked this earth as flesh and blood so that he could be in a position to help us become recovering sinners. He became like us in every respect so that he could be our high priest, and he can make sacrifices forever for all our sin. Because Jesus was tested, and by because he was suffered, he's in a position to help us who are being tested and suffer each day. Think about this for a minute. The, Lon the Reverend Lonnie Davis can help homeless addicts because he was once what? Homeless and he was an addict. Jesus Christ can help us because he was tempted and suffered just like human beings have for thousands of years. Because he once suffered and was tempted, he can help us. 
Do not ever forget that Jesus is always able to help you wherever you are, whatever you're going through, because he knows exactly where you are and where your journey is. However, empathetic understanding is not enough to fully restore us. The restoration of what had ravaged, the purification of what has been defiled, always requires something new to occur. It demands some kind of sacrifice. To redo something requires a death, a cessation of some kind, a change of some kind. To get unstuck from old habits we developed over years means letting go of some of those old habits, letting them die, if you will. Whether we're talking about forest management, we're talking about ACT scores, something has to give. It may be clear-cutting, it may be taking out the rotted boards in a piece of furniture or a house, it may be laziness has to go, it may mean our old ways of being unfruitful and unfaithful have to go, but something has to go. And in our case, it was Jesus Christ who went. Hear that again. In our case, it was Jesus Christ who went. He went all the way to the cross, once and for all, when he offered himself. The death of Jesus on the cross gave us, now, not only for now, but for forever. It gave us, not only for now, but forever, forgiveness from our sins and reconciliation to our Creator, the Lord God both of which are desperately needed for all of us. You see, complete cleansing calls for nothing less than the cross and the empty tomb. Nothing less will do. If you want complete cleansing in your life, it requires the cross and the empty tomb. And only the great high priest can do that for you and me, the one above us all. Sometimes we too need to pick up the cross to heal the wounds in our lives. Cher, I know, some things Cher did weren't, aren't so great, but she did write one great song. Well, she probably wrote more than one. She wrote that song, I, If I Could Turn Back Time. Anyone remember that song? I'm not going to sing it for you right now, so you can just be relieved. But I want you to hear these lyrics. If I could turn back time, if I could find a way, I'd take back those words that hurt you. I don't know why I did the things I did. I don't know why I said the things I said. The bad news is we can't turn back time. What we said and what we did occurred. But we can time our turn back to confession and the cross. We can time our turn back to the confession and the cross, and there is no time to do that like right now. So my challenge for you this week is threefold. I want you to spend an hour sometime this week. I know it's Halloween, trick-or-treating, all that stuff, and I can tell you all are a big bunch of trick-or-treaters in this room, okay? But find an hour. Find an hour and a piece of paper if you want, and write down, think and pray, and write down the name of one person that you think most needs encouragement in your life. Second thing is write down the name of one person you think you might have offended in some way. I know none of you offend anyone, but just in case, okay? And then write down a third person, a person that has offended you. Write those names down and then pray about them. Pray and ask for guidance and wisdom, to take action in those relationships. The one who you say needs encouragement, find a way, pray that you might find a way to, to find a way to offer that encouragement, to offer them the gift of this high priest that's there for them 
as well as you. On the relationship issues with someone who might have offended you or you might have offended, be like the beggar at the gate, Bartimaeus, who, who begged for Jesus, for Jesus to heal him. Pray to the high priest for guidance on how to heal that relation. Pray for guidance that the high priest might engage in your relationship and help you heal that relationship. You may discover that God's calling you to take some sort of action, a call, a letter, or a note, or whatever it is, but pray about it. You see, this is the position of real grace. It's offered to us by the great high priest, the great high priest who is above us all. He is the one who can help us with our earthly restoration and our internal restoration as well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.